So we're continuing our study through the book of Job. And I'm not going to lie, the, the, the first three chapters of this book, a little bit of a tough read, isn't it? I mean, we encounter a man who is enduring some... In chapters 1 and 2, we, we see Job, we see this amazing man of God. A man that the Bible describes as, as upright, as blameless, as full of integrity. God himself says that there is nobody like Job on the earth. Yet, in chapters 1 and 2, we see Job literally lose everything. He loses his children. He loses his wealth, all of his possessions, and he even loses his health. And chapter 2 basically ends with Job sitting in a, in a trash heap full of ashes, scraping the oozing boils and sores all over his body. It's pretty gross, right? And it's pretty tragic. Yet after losing everything, after all of this, look what Job says in chapter 1, verse 20. He says, The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Catch what he says next, though. He says, praise, praise the name of the Lord. What an amazing response from Job in the middle of his suffering, in the middle of his pain, in the middle of his hurt, in the middle of his immense suffering and, and pain. He, he praises the Lord. It's incredible, isn't it? And in and through all of this, the Bible tells us that Job never sinned by cursing the Lord. He doesn't sin by blaming God or by charging God with any wrongdoing. You see, Job, he understood that everything was created by God and everything ultimately belongs to God. He understood this truth, and it's a truth that's really difficult to swallow, but God has the right to give, and God has the right to take away. And this is a really hard truth, but we have to learn to hold on to the things of this world loosely. And when we learn to do that, it invites us and it draws us to hold on to God more tightly. Now, Job doesn't sin by cursing God like Satan surely thought he would. Job doesn't sin by cursing God like his wife even encouraged him to do in chapter 2. No, we don't see Job do that. But when we get to chapter 3, in chapter 3, it's a sad scene. We see Job, we see him finally speak, and we see him begin to cry out to God and curse the very day he was born. This amazing man of God, he found himself in a place of deep despair. His hurt, his pain, his loss, his suffering had become so great, so immense, that he literally wished he had never been born. And chapter 3, chapter 3 ends with these really somber words from Job. He says, I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, only trouble comes. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're here today and you're just going through it. You're in a season of loss. You're in a season of despair. You're in a season of suffering. Maybe you feel like Job this morning. Maybe you feel like Job. Maybe you feel like you have no peace. Maybe you feel like you have no quietness. Maybe you feel like you have no rest. Maybe you feel like you're in a season where only trouble has come. And if that's you this morning, I pray. I pray that God would reveal his truth to you. I pray that God would encourage you this morning. I pray that God would give you his peace, his peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray that God would comfort you. I pray that God would give you rest. 
that he'd give you rest in the middle of your storm, that he'd give you rest in the middle of your hurt, he'd give you rest in the middle of your pain, in the middle of your despair. I pray that he would give you rest in the middle of your suffering. Knowing, knowing that God is there with you through it all and that he is in complete control of all of it. So this morning, before we get there, I'm going to take some water here. I was getting thirsty, and I was waiting for, like, the right cue. Um, this is a good break. So this morning, we're going to do kind of an overview of Job chapters 4 through 31. It's a lot of Scripture to cover, so we're going to move pretty quickly. And in this section of Scripture, basically we see a conversation between Job and his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And it's a pretty long conversation. Actually, the conversation started last week with Job, which you guys covered, and it goes on and on and on for about 28 chapters. And the general flow of this conversation is this. Job's friends, they're going to speak, and then Job's going to reply. And we're going to see kind of three rounds of this back and forth. We're going to see three rounds of this verbal sparring, if you will. And the topic of discussion is really a question that they're all wrestling with, a question that they're all struggling with. And the question is basically this, why does God allow suffering? And Job, more specifically, is wrestling with this question of why does God allow the righteous to suffer? Why does God allow those who follow him to suffer? So to put it more simply, why do bad things happen to good people? In week one, we saw that the book of Job is actually one of the oldest books in the Bible. Some scholars even say it might be the oldest book in the Bible. Now, I find this fascinating. One of the first books in the Bible is about a bunch of guys struggling, wrestling with this question, why does God allow suffering? They suffer, or they, they, they struggled with this question then, and don't we struggle with this question today? We still struggle with this question thousands of years later. And I've got a spoiler alert for all of you. God never gives us a definitive answer to this question in the book of Job. You will not find a detailed explanation from God of the why of Job's suffering. Have you guys ever asked God why? Why, God, is this happening to me? Why, God, did you take my son, my daughter, my spouse, my loved one, my friend? Why, God, am, am I battling cancer? Why, God, am I dealing with this chronic pain? Why, God, did I lose my job? Why, God, is my marriage in shambles? Why, God, is, are my finances in ruin? Why, God, why? Have you ever asked God why and felt like he didn't? Well, so today I titled our message... What do we do when God doesn't answer our why? There's only one thing we can do. When we find ourselves in a season of suffering, when we find ourselves crying out to God asking why, and he doesn't seem to give us a reply, we trust. We trust that no matter what we're going through, God is still good. We trust that in the middle of our suffering, God is there. He is present. He is with us. We trust that God is wise and all-knowing. And we trust. We trust that no matter how bad things seem, God is still our hope. If you guys have your notes, let's open those up. Point number one today. Trust. That in our suffering, God is still good. 
So let's quick go back and kind of do a refresher review of chapters one and two. In these chapters, Satan basically challenges God, and he says to God that Job only worships him because of the blessings, because of the gifts that God gives to him. Satan says, take those things away, and he will not worship you. So those things are taken away from Job, right? And what does Job do? He still worships God. Satan says, well, Job still got his health. Take that from Job, and he won't worship you anymore. And guess what? That's right. Job still worships God. And in Job chapter 2, verse 10, he says this. He says, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? What Job is showing us is that even when the gifts of God are gone, even when we find ourselves in a season where we feel like we've lost everything, God is still good. You see, we might question our circumstances. We might question God's why, but we do not ever have to question God's goodness. Now, here's where Job and, and his friends come into play, because they're going to propose some of their thoughts about God's why. They're going to propose some of their thoughts about how God works. Basically, they're going to propose a theology, and it turns out that their theology is wrong. Their reason for God's why is wrong. In Job 42, 7, he says this. He says, he says to Job, he says, tell your friends, I'm angry at them because what they have is not true. But as you read their speeches, it's a little tricky because not everything they say is wrong. You're going to hear them say some true things. We're going to hear them say some good things. We're going to even hear them say some theologically sound things. But here's where we have to be careful. See, we can take God's word, we can take his truth, and we kind of can twist it and, and bend it to apply to, to our situation or to apply to our own biases about God. And that's kind of what we see Job's friends do. And in doing this, it turned out to be some, some pretty bad counsel for Job. And here's kind of the gist of their counsel, okay? You ready? Job, God blesses the righteous, those who do right. And he afflicts or punishes the unrighteous, those who do wrong. Plain and simple. So Job, since you're being afflicted, this must mean what? That's right, Job. This must mean you are unrighteous. This must mean that you have done something wrong to deserve this. So you guys ready to check out what they have to say? All right, so we're going to be in chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. It should be in your notes. First up is his friend, friend, Eliphaz. He says this. He says, consider now who being innocent has ever perished, ever destroyed. As I've observed it, as I see things, in my opinion is what he's saying, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God, they perish. At the blast of his anger, they are no more. FYI, maybe jot this down. This is probably not the best verse to quote when somebody's going through some suffering. Basically, what he's saying is, mind you to a guy who's literally lost everything, what he's saying is like, Job, bro, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. If you're going through all of this, Job, it's because you've done something wrong. He's almost telling him, like, you deserve it, bro. Let's go to chapter 5, verse 17. He says, blessed is the one whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. From six calamities he will rescue you. In seven, no harm will touch you. In famine, he will deliver you from death, and in battle, from the stroke of the sword. Now, there's some truth here. God does correct and discipline us sometimes. 
In fact, Hebrews 12 tells us that as children of God, we should welcome the discipline of God. He'll correct us. He'll discipline us. And in doing that, he is shaping us and molding us to be more like Christ. But again, it's in Eliphaz's application. What he's saying, he's saying that Job's suffering is a direct result of some sin in his life. And if Job would just repent, if he would just turn to God, everything would be okay. If he would just confess, everything will go well again. Now let's jump to chapter 8. And we're going to see what his friend Bildad has to say. Now Bildad, he comes in a little bit, a little more hot, a little bit more aggressive. Look what he says here. Chapter 2. How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Now look what he says in in 4. Check it out. He says, when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Did you guys catch that? Bildad is essentially saying that the reason Job's children died was because of their sin. The reason that the, their house blew down by the wind was because there was a bunch of sinners in that house. Now maybe write this down as well, and this should go without saying, but this is really bad counsel for somebody who's just lost a child. But this was kind of a common thought in that. We even see this type of thinking in the New Testament. Remember in John chapter 9, Jesus, he heals the blind man. And right after, his disciples asked, they said, is this man blind because of his sin or his father's sin? So this idea that, that Job and his children would be punished for a specific sin. Let's get back to Bildad's speech. Verse 5, you got it up there? But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now, he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore to you your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. So he kind of says the same thing that Eliphaz is saying, but he kind of adds a little bit to it. He says, if you would repent, if you would confess your sin, if you would turn to God, he will restore everything. He's saying, Job, get right with God, and you once again will have wealth and, and health and, and prosperity and security. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like a false, false gospel that we sometimes hear today? Kind of a name it, claim it. If you have enough faith, God will give you this, he'll give you that, he'll give you that. Then we get to chapter 11. And his friend Zophar enters the picture. Now, throughout all of these speeches, I told you that Job was replying. And Job continually claimed his innocence. Now, Job wasn't saying that he was completely innocent. Job wasn't saying that he was perfect or that he had never sinned. I mean, you see Job acknowledge his sinfulness all throughout his speeches. But what he is saying is saying, I have not done anything to warrant what I am experiencing right now. And his friend Zophar, man, he jumps in on him for this. Zophar rebukes Job. Look at chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. He says, you say to God, my beliefs are flawless and I'm pure in your sight. Verse 5, he says, oh, I wish, I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, Job. God has even forgotten some of your sins. He's kind of like, you know what? I just wish God would set you straight, pal. You think you're being punished? God has even forgotten some of your sins, buddy. Verse 13, he says, Yet, if you devote your heart to him, and stretch out your hands to him. If you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then, free of fault, you will lift your face. You will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble 
recalling it only as waters gone by. So I said this earlier, but Job's friends, in all of their speeches, we're going to see a little truth. We're going to see some good counsel here and there. Zophar is basically calling Job to repent. And repentance, hear me, is so important in our lives as followers of Jesus. We should continue to ask God to, to examine our hearts to show us any sin that needs to be dealt with. We should continually and daily turn from ourselves and turn to God. We need to continually do that. And we see Zophar, he actually kind of lays out a pretty solid four-step process to repentance. Number one, he says, devote yourself to God. Have a single-minded focus on the things of God. Don't be divided between the things of this world and the things of God. Number two, he says, stretch your hands to him in prayer for forgiveness. Ask God for forgiveness. Number three, he says, put your sin far away. The Bible teaches us that we should run, we should flee from sin. And number four, he says, don't allow any sin in your tent. We don't need to hide our sin, folks. First John tells us that if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So again, we see some good counsel here, but it's the application. Zophar, like his friends, has this false assumption that Job's circumstances are only a, resort, a result of some specific sin. And that if he would just confess this sin, all would go well again. Basically, they're presenting a really simplified theology that says God always blesses the righteous and he always afflicts or punishes the unrighteous. Elphed, Bildad, and Zophar only saw suffering as evidence of God's displeasure. Now, don't get me wrong. We see all throughout Scripture the damaging effects of sin. And sometimes sin can lead to trouble and suffering in our lives. But to say that sin is the only reason we experience suffering isn't necessarily true. So what if we didn't see suffering only as evidence of God's displeasure in our lives, but we saw suffering as a means for us to know and treasure God more deeply? You see, that's really where the entire book of Job is heading. I want us to fast forward to chapter 42. And now we're going to cover this more in a few weeks, but this is, let's look at Job's final words to God. Know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is that that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things Far too wonderful for me. Verse 4, he said, You said, listen and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Now hear this, verse 5. This is where the whole book of Job is really heading. He said, I had only heard about you before. Catch this. But now, now I have seen you with my own eyes. Job's suffering led him to know and treasure God more deeply. Romans 5, 3 says that we can glory in our suffering because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. goes on to say that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. Suffering draws us closer to God so we can treasure him more deeply and so we can experience his love more fully. And this truth, this truth right here has rung so true in my life. As many of you know, our, our family, we've been through a lot. In 2008, I lost my, my twin brother, in 2019, I lost my, my older brother. And those seasons 
Those seasons were hard. They're still hard. But I can say, I can say with absolute certainty that those seasons of suffering 100% brought me closer to God. They led me to know God more. They led me to depend on God more. And they led me to treasure him more. I have never felt more loved. I've never felt more seen. My God, than in those seasons of suffering, and for that I can honestly rejoice in the suffering I've endured, and I can sit up here this morning and say, even in your season of suffering, God is still good. So when you find yourself in a season of suffering, when all feels like it's lost, when the gifts of God seem gone, when the house is gone, the money's gone, the job's gone, your health is gone, your loved one is gone, God is still good. Can we say amen? amen. That's what Job is saying in, verse, in chapter 13, verse 5. He says, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. So when you find yourself in a season of suffering, you find yourself crying out to God, Why? Why, God, and you seem to get no reply, trust. Trust that in your suffering, God is still good. Number two, trust that in our suffering, God is present. So often when we find ourselves in a season of suffering, we can feel like God has abandoned us. We cry out to God, we ask him why, we ask him to deliver us, and it just seems like he's silent. We don't see evidence of God working in our lives, so we just assume he's not present. But as you read through the book of Job, you will see that in just about every one of Job's speeches, he addresses God in some way. Let's look at chapter 7, verses 17 through 19. He says this, he says, What is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention? That you examine them every morning and test them every moment? Will you never look away from me or let me alone for even an instant? So while Job wrestled with the why of God, he doesn't really wrestle with the presence of God. He doesn't doubt that God is there in the middle of suffering. But often in our suffering, you know what? We do want a why, don't we? We do want an explanation. And the truth is, God doesn't always give us a why. God doesn't always give us an explanation, but you know what he always gives us? His presence. God always gives us himself. Now maybe you're here this morning, you're like, yeah, but I still want a why. I gotta know why. I want an explanation. I'm gonna ask you a challenging question. Do you really? Do you really need a why? Do you really need an explanation? Is that really even the deepest desire of your heart to know why? Think about it this way. When my wife is going through something difficult, when she's struggling, does she need my reasons and my explanations as to why she's going through what she's going through? Wives, do you need that? No. Her greatest need is not my diagnosis of the situation. She doesn't need my explanation. You know what she needs? She needs my presence. She doesn't need me to tell her why. She just needs me to be there with her. And one of the greatest things we see in the book of Job is God's presence. We don't see a God who is distant. We see a God who is right there with Job every step of the way. With Job in his suffering. And hear me, Cornerstone, this is a beautiful truth of the gospel. You see, we don't serve a God who is distant. We don't serve a God who is uninvolved. We don't serve a God who is far away. No, we serve a God who pursued us with his love. He pursued us with his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his goodness. We serve a God that came to us and became like us. Hebrews 4 did, said that he did that so that he could sympathize with us. So that he could sympathize with us in our hurt, in our pain, in our loss. 
in our despair, and in our suffering. So if you're here today and you feel broken, Jesus was broken. If you're here today and you feel rejected, Jesus was rejected. If you're here this morning and you feel hurt, Jesus was hurt. If you're here this morning and you are crying out to God, why? Jesus cried out. Remember Jesus on the cross. Why, God? Why have you forsaken me? You see, Jesus, he is familiar with your hurt. He's familiar with your pain. He's familiar with your suffering. And he is right there with you through it all. I mentioned earlier that in 2019, I lost my older brother, Justin. Some of you have known him. We, we always called him Judd. And I don't say this, this part of his story out loud very often. It's hard for me to say. But Justin took his life in 2019 up at Red Rock Mountains. And I remember being there and we were, we were driving back home. And any time I had kind of a longer drive on my hands, I would always pick up my phone and I'd always call my brother Justin. And so out of just habit, I went, reached for my phone, went to pick up to call Judd. And I was just hit, just socked in the face with the reality that I was never going to talk to my brother Judd again. And I was overwhelmed with emotion, overwhelmed with just hurt and with pain and with some anger and with some despair. And I can't explain it, but in that moment, I have never felt the presence of Jesus so strongly in my life. It's still hard for me to explain, but when I tell people, it was literally like Jesus was sitting on my passenger side seat, just sitting there with me in it. And every time I would get in the car, that was that place where it would just hit me like a ton of bricks. And for months, I literally felt the presence of Jesus sitting in that front seat with me. So hear me. If you feel alone in your suffering, if you feel alone in your hurt, God has not abandoned you. Do you hear me? God has not abandoned you, and he will not abandon you. And I ask you, if you ever doubt that truth for even a single moment, I ask you to fix your eyes on the cross. Evidence, not only of his goodness, but of his presence in your life. So what are we going to do, people of God, when we find ourselves in a season of suffering, when we find ourselves crying out to God, we're going to trust we're going to trust that even in it, God is still good, and we're going to trust that God is always present. Number three, bless you. Trust that in our suffering, God is wise. So we're going to look at Job chapter 28. Now Job is a part of a, a group of books in the Old Testament called the Wisdom Books. And in these books... They show us and teach us about the wisdom of God. And in Job chapter 28, we get a picture of the price and the value. We're also going to see the relationship between God and wisdom and man and wisdom. Job chapter 28, verse 12. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends it on earth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. I love this. The deep says, it is not in me. The sea says, it is not with me. With the finest gold, nor can its price be... You guys still hear me? Am I cutting? Okay. You hear me when I'm out? Okay. I'll get loud. Oh, I'll get loud. <laughs> Verse 20. <laughs> Reset. We're in a serious scripture here. Verse 20. Where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say, 
only rumor of it has reached us. Now, verse 23, we're going to see the contrast between the wisdom of man and God. Look what he says. Verse 23, God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth, and he sees everything under the sun. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorms, then he looked at wisdom, and he appraised it. He confirmed it, and he tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. Now in these verses, we see that wisdom, wisdom is this valuable jewel. Wisdom, it is, it's priceless. And we see that it cannot be found in anyone or anything other than God. God alone knows where wisdom dwells. Now when I think of wisdom like a definition of wisdom, and I know this is super simplistic, but this is kind of the way I think about it. It's the, it's the ability to take in all the information about a particular circumstance or situation and then use that information to make the best possible decision. And there's three aspects of wisdom I want us to think about. Three aspects to have perfect and complete wisdom. First, we need knowledge. We need perspective, and we need experience. Now, in some way, us, people, we lack in all three. We lack knowledge. Often, we don't make wise decisions because we don't have all the facts. Have you ever made a decision and then found out some new information? And then you're like, man, if I would have known that then, I would have made a completely different decision decision. See, we lack knowledge because we don't have complete knowledge. The past, we can have some knowledge of the present, but we have no knowledge of the future. We lack perspective. Not only do we not know all things, we can't see all things. And the perspective we do have, it can often be jaded or distorted, right? Especially in a season of suffering. We can't know how everyone around us feels. We can't know their point of view. We can't know how our decision is going to affect every single person. Bottom line is, we cannot see the entire picture of every single situation. And lastly, we lack experience. Have you ever been through a particular if you've ever been through a, a particular experience, you're likely wiser for it, right? The first time you go through something, sometimes we don't know how to deal with it, or we don't know what the right decision is, right? But after you've been through something a few times, time after time after time, chances are you have a better idea of how to handle it, right? Well, we're finite beings with a finite number of years on this earth, with a finite number of experiences, so we cannot possibly know how to deal with everything because we haven't walked through everything. You see, we all lack knowledge. Even the smartest people in this room, we all lack perspective. Even the most sensitive, discerning people here. And we all lack experience. Even those who have been through the most. But God, God lacks nothing. He has perfect knowledge. God always has all the facts. He never finds out anything after the fact. You're never going to hear God say like, oh, I wish I would have known that. I would have done something different. No, God knows everything. He has a complete knowledge of both our past, our present, and our future. God has eternal perspective. Not only does God know everything, he also sees everything. God has a bird's eye view over everything and everyone. We see that in chapter one, don't we? All this is going on. Where He can see it all. He sees every detail, and he knows how it's going to affect every single person for all of time and all of eternity. Kind of crazy, right? 
God's perspective is eternal and it is completely perfect. So we see God has perfect knowledge, he has eternal perspective, and he has infinite experience. God is the uncreated creator. He created all things and he exists eternally. Simply put, God has some experience governing this universe. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer regarding wisdom. Now he gives a much more profound definition than I gave you. I like his better, but it says, should have just started with this. Wisdom, among other things, is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect ways. What if, what if even in our suffering, God is orchestrating the perfect situation in our lives. That's really the essence of Romans 8.28, isn't it? For we know that God works all things. Yes, all things, even our suffering, for the good of those who love him. Now, we can't always see God's wisdom. We don't always understand God's wisdom. And we don't always see God working in our lives And this can be especially true in our suffering. But know this. Hear me when I say this, church. We do not serve a do-nothing God. God is always doing something. God is always at work. And what he is doing is always pointed towards our good and ultimately his glory. So when we take the perfect and complete knowledge, perspective, and experience, and wisdom of God. And now we pair that with the perfect character of God, his perfect love, his perfect grace, his perfect forgiveness, his perfect goodness. We can trust God in our suffering, can't we? I got one more quote from Tozer, and I love this one. It says, with, I'm going to read it slow, with the goodness of God, to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? You see, we can trust that in God's perfect wisdom, he is devising the perfect situation in our lives. And he will achieve this situation by the most perfect means. And this truth is true even in our suffering. So, when we find ourselves in the middle of suffering, we find ourselves asking God why, we're going to trust what? We're going to trust that he's still good. We're going to trust that he's what? Present. And we're going to trust that he's all wise. We're going to close with this point here. PG, you can kind of work your way up. You probably don't have to play right away. but (laughs) So I want to take a quick moment as we close just to remind us of the depths of Job's despair. You guys ready? Like more depressing stuff? (sighs) Chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. If only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales it would surely outweigh the sands of the sea. Go down to verse 8. Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant what I hope for, that God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut off my life. It keeps going. Chapter 10, verse 20. Are not my few days almost over? Turn away from me so I can have a moment's joy before I go to the place of no return, to the land of gloom and utter darkness, to the land of deepest night of utter darkness and disorder, where even light is darkness. Chapter 17, verse 1, my spirit is broken. My days are cut short. The grave awaits me. One more before we get to the good stuff. Verse 13, chapter 17, if the only home I hope for is the grave, 
If I spread out my bed in the realm of darkness, if I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother or my sister, where then is my hope? Who can see any hope for me? Will we descend together into the dust? We see all throughout the book of Job the depths of Job's despair. We see a man who is broken. We see a man here who is beginning to lose hope. But then we get to chapter 19. And we get one of the most beautiful, one of the most amazing passages in the book of Job. Look what he says here. Amidst his pain, amidst his loss, his hurt, his despair, and his suffering. He says this, Job chapter 19, verses 23 through 27. He says, oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. Basically, he's saying, like, guys, write this down. Verse 25, hear this. I love this. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, hear this, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I, and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. What an amazing declaration of faith. Job knows that even though he's in the middle of suffering, this is not the end of his story. Job knew that his Redeemer lived and that he would one day see his face. We see the word Redeemer in the book of Ruth to describe a love that pays for another. In the book of Exodus, we see it used to describe the one who delivers. And all throughout the Bible, we see that word used to describe the one who makes all things new. Job was pointing us to Jesus, our Redeemer, who lives. Our Redeemer, who loved us so much that he went to the cross to pay the price for our sin. Our Redeemer, who has delivered us from death, and our Redeemer, who is making all things new. And so if you're here this morning and you're walking through something, if you're here this morning and you're suffering, if you're here this morning and you feel like all hope is lost, remember, Jesus, your Redeemer, lives. And one day you will see his face and he will make all things new. Look at Re Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 5 says. And I don't think this is in your notes, so maybe just write down that address and just read over it this week. It's one of, I think, one of the, the most amazing verses in all of Scripture. I love it. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, I love verse 4. And if you're here today, if you're hurting, if you feel broken, if you feel like all hope is lost, if you are suffering, I want you to press in, and I want you to hear what verse 4 has to say. Hear this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Verse 5. He who was sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Now, guys, I don't want to downplay. I don't want to set aside anyone's pain, anyone's hurt, anyone's suffering. 
But I do want to remind you that there is a time when Jesus is coming back, when our Redeemer is coming back. We are going to see his face, and he's going to make all things new. When you're in your season of suffering, remember there is coming a time where there's going to be no more hurt, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears, no more suffering. we got to have an eternal perspective when it comes to our suffering. And I'm going to close with this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. And this verse is always a comfort to me. And I pray that it would be a comfort to you. It says, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce us for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I can't say it enough. Think about eternity. Downplay our suffering. But we're here maybe, maybe 80 years and it can be tough. But we get to spend eternity forever and ever and ever and ever in the presence of God where all things will be new, where everything will be perfect, where your body will be restored, your health will be restored. There'll be no more hurt. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. And so when we find ourselves in a season of hurt, a season of loss, a season of suffering, we're going to trust. We're going to trust that God is still good. We're going to trust that God is present. We're going to trust that God is with us in that suffering. We're going to trust that God is all wise and all knowing and that he is always working for our good. And we are going to keep our eyes fixed on our only hope, on our Redeemer, on Jesus Christ who lives and who is coming back to make all things new.